I'm Kylie Schmidt. And I'm Katie Pavlich, and this is Arizona Cat's Eye, the University of Arizona School of Journalism student news magazine. Coming up, we'll give you an inside look into the issues facing the Tucson community, from libraries on wheels to the U.S.-Mexico border. It's all next in this edition of Arizona Cat's Eye. Tucson has been granted $63 million to change the way you get around town. The modern streetcar will be similar to Phoenix's light rail, but will be specific to Tucson's needs. Arizona Cat's Eye reporter Sarah Carson takes us to Phoenix to show us the future of Tucson's transportation system. The modern streetcar has been talked about since 2003, but with the large federal grant, plus money set aside by the Regional Transportation Authority, the $115 million project is finally being put in motion. Gary Hayes with the RTA explains that the modern streetcar will mirror Phoenix's light rail, but will have a much shorter four-mile route. In terms of looks, it's not going to look that differently. It's going to, that's why they call it a modern streetcar. It, it has a sleek look to it. It looks like a modern-day light rail system. The modern-day streetcar will start right here at the University Medical Center. From there, it will go through campus, down 4th Avenue, and end up on Congress Street near Granada. Phoenix local Pat Gentry has ridden the light rail on multiple occasions and said he thinks it will be a positive addition to Tucson. It's very comfortable, uh, especially in the summer when it's air conditioned and it's nice inside. And it's fairly quiet. And it's easy to travel, get on and get off. Like Phoenix, Tucson plans to partner up with the local bus system. Hayes said that the fare for riding the streetcar would be the same as riding the Suntran, which is currently $1.45. University of Arizona student Maddie Haight said she's looking forward to the streetcar so she doesn't have to worry about driving so much, especially at night. I would definitely take the modern streetcar um, out at night with my friends. I think it would save a lot of time and uh, probably a lot of money than taking a cab. The streetcar is expected to run from 6 a.m. to 2 a.m. Monday through Sunday. Hayes said they want to get it up and running by 2012. For Arizona Cat's Eye, I'm Sarah Carson. The RTA is currently working on a reloadable smart card that can be used both on the SunTran buses and the modern streetcar. Graffiti is expensive to remove and Tucson City Council member Steve Kazachik says the city needs help paying for it. Kazachik is working on a plan to make parents financially responsible for removing graffiti done by their own children. Our Natalie Fox hit the streets to find out if this plan would help. Graffiti removal costs the city of Tucson between $60,000 to $70,000 a month. That's according to Graffiti Protective Coating, the company that cleans up graffiti for the city. Council member Steve Gazachik drafted the ordinance that holds parents responsible for their children's actions by making them pay for a cleanup and take measures to keep their children from tagging again. The goal is to get our arms around the problem in a non-judicial sense early. Uh, and, and then if the parents are just unwilling to do it, then hold them accountable for the fact that, you know what, you, when you become a parent, there's some responsibilities that go along with that. Before the ordinance passed, property owners were solely responsible for graffiti cleanup. We were here just yesterday, and this whole wall was all tagged up with graffiti. So as you can see, Tucson's doing a pretty good job of cleaning it up quickly. Now, they just want Tucson parents on their side. Mother of three, Tammy Kelly, thinks holding parents responsible is a good idea. Parents are responsible for what their children do. If they're not going to take the initiative to know where their children are and what they're doing and they get into this kind of trouble, then they should have to help pay for it. But 17-year-old Kren Buendia says young vandals should bear the responsibility for their actions. They should still be responsible because they went out and did it instead of making their parents have to pay for something they didn't do. Graffiti Protective Coating employee David Caceres says his company gets between 200 to 300 calls a day about damaged property. You know, put them in a, an active program where if they like tagging or they like art, you know, enroll them in an art class or uh, a place where they can actually express their work. The ordinance states that parents won't face jail time, but they will have to pay fines if their children are found guilty for tagging more than once. For Arizona Cat's Eye, I'm Natalie Fox. Since passing in 2006, Proposition 300 has made it impossible for students to receive financial aid without U.S. citizenship. Now teachers and students from the University of Arizona say they're concerned that the ban is threatening campus diversity. 
Arizona Cat's Eye reporter Michelle Denton goes to campus to find out how the proposition is changing U of A. In 1891, classes at the University of Arizona began with 32 students. Today, with an enrollment rate of 38,000 students, some policies and procedures have changed. Proposition 300, approved by Arizona voters in 2006, denies financial aid to students who cannot prove they are legally in this country. U of A freshman Bianca Delgado is concerned that this new law may hurt diversity on campus. I think U of A is a somewhat diverse campus. Yeah, there's a lot of people from many different cultures and backgrounds, but I think that it needs to be encouraged more. Assistant Professor Roberto Rodriguez for the Department of Mexican American and Raza Studies explains how certain programs are not allowed to use their funds to help students who are not legal. You have a strict prohibition as to who can attend uh, college, who can receive financial aid. The biggest tragedy in my opinion is that it's the, it's the equivalent of self-censorship. That is the National Hispanic Scholarship Foundation they get millions upon millions of dollars to help students. And there is no legal prohibition for them to create a scholarship for these students, and they don't. This map from 1562 is a map of New Spain, a Spanish colony which later became Mexico after Mexican independence in 1821. Now, some students from these regions are not allowed to pay in-state tuition to Arizona universities without proof of lawful immigration status. U of A senior Diana Pinunri is one of several students who cross the border from Nogales to Tucson for school every day. So when I was in middle school, I used to cross back the border every day, but it wasn't a problem. It got easier actually because the customs got to know us, so they would just let us pass because they knew we were going to school. Pinunri says many students cross the border to go to school in the United States, but now with recent tuition hikes and Proposition 300, some are concerned that it might be limiting the number of students from Mexico who can afford a higher education. For Arizona Cat's Eye, I'm Michelle Denton. Ever wanted the library so close that you could walk to it? The Pima County Library has one man who takes books to the streets, but now his route may be cut short. Arizona Cat's Eye reporter Megan Wallace has more. For the last 15 years, Wade Zelnack has been stocking the bookmobile with some of the Pima County Library's most popular books. People love it. Uh... When I'm driving down the road, people just wave and honk, and I get a lot of thumbs up. The 38-foot-long RV bus makes 25 stops a week throughout Pima County and gets a variety of customers along the way. I was curious about it, so I stepped inside, and I like how small it was, and everything is there for me to see. The bookmobile has magazines, DVDs, and hundreds of books, but Zelenek says the cost of fuel and upkeep could stop these materials from reaching the neighborhoods. The library has been affected. I have been too. It's pretty much just a one-person operation. It's just me. County administrators were not available to comment on just how much was being cut from the bookmobile fund, but Zelnek says the budget will be shifted within the next three months. Community member Perlita Buford hopes the bookmobile stops won't be shortened anytime soon. If they're not getting a library close by, they're probably not getting a preschool or a Head Start, so they, they really need that. For now, Zelnak will continue to focus on what he does best, getting the books to the people. For Arizona Cat's Eye, I'm Megan Wallace. We're taking you to the wild, wild west, but could the economy soon shut these cowboys down for good? Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Tucson is known for its natural desert beauty. However, a new project is bringing back a different form of visual appeal to the city. Reporter Megan Neighbor has more. I started the sign business in 1976. I've been involved with signs since 1972. Um, started out as a sign painter. I learned how to hand paint. And that's what I did for the first at least 10 or 12 years. And in the last 10 years or so, we've really gotten into doing more electrical work, neon signs. There's nothing that you can do that can catch the intensity of neon. Um, you know, it's, a, it's such a pure advertising form, it's hard to ignore it. And then you get, you know, historically, it, it started in about, I think they brought neon to the United States in about 25. The old highway route 
that ran through Tucson, Miracle Mile, Oracle, Drachman, Stone, South Six, and Benson Highway, um, was uh, the pairing of two cross-country routes, 80 and 89. And starting in the 1930s, after the introduction of neon signs, hotels and restaurants began, um, began installing these signs to lure customers off of the freeway and compete with each other. Today, as we look and we conduct surveys and really look at how many of these signs exist, there's less than about 125 that are still extant in the community. They are certainly worthy of preservation because they provide so much character and so much distinctive um, charm in our city. I was working in my studio one day a couple years ago and started getting phone calls, the old lantern sign is coming down, the old lantern sign is coming down. So I now have the old lantern in my backyard. The Pima County Historical Commission has put together a subcommittee which is working on revisions to the City of Tucson sign code to preserve historic landmark signs. Right now the way the code works, the historic signs tend to be out of compliance. They're either too big or they're located in places that today you couldn't put a sign. So we're looking for ways to let them restore the signs and either keep them in place or move them someplace more appropriate. I think of historic signs as kind of folk art. You know, they're regionally specific because they were for businesses that were in the area. So it's important to save what's left of the, the examples that are still out there.